The stories began generations ago. Stories about this nearly 200-year-old house on a hill in Gallatin County, Illinois, and its original owner, John Hart Crenshaw. Many of the stories surround the attic and its 12 tiny rooms. 20th century owners of the house say Crenshaw used the rooms as holding cells for African Americans he would later sell into slavery. A story repeated to tens of thousands who visited the site when it was operated as a tourist attraction for 70 years until the late 1990s. Those stories also mention Robert Wilson, who was also known as Uncle Bob, and his alleged role with slave breeding in one of those third floor rooms. Ghost hunters say Crenshaw House is one of the most haunted houses in Illinois. Today, the Crenshaw House belongs to the state of Illinois and is closed to the public. Its future depends in part on what is found over the next year and a half as archaeologists excavate the yard and crawl space beneath the house. Architectural studies will look at building materials and other evidence to re-envision the original appearance of the mysterious third floor attic. How these rooms were built may help explain why they were built. And investigators will track the final years of Robert Wilson's life and compare the known facts with the legend of Uncle Bob. Crenshaw House is a rare survivor of a lesser known era of Illinois history. For several years following statehood in 1818, slavery existed in Illinois. A worker could be indentured to someone for decades. Those indentures could be bought, sold, and enforced as a property right. Slaves from southern states could work in Illinois for 12 months before they were required to return to their slave state of origin. Then they could be sent back to Illinois for another 12 months. These exceptions were created to give the state salt industry the labor it needed to compete. That there's this exclusion zone around the U.S. salines where slavery will be allowed in order to work them until the year 1825. There's this seven-year exception made only for the salines. Crenshaw needed as many workers as he could find. For a time, he operated the government salines, a process that required huge amounts of labor. Crenshaw also needed workers at his home to do whatever chores the large estate required. Family letters mention at least one African-American servant, something investigators hope to learn more about. Mark Wagner, director of Southern Illinois University Carbondale Center for Archaeological Investigations, will lead the project. There are no artifacts associated with the Crenshaw family. Uh, so we're hoping to recover things here, both associated with the Crenshaws themselves and their African-American servants that will help interpret the site. During the 19th century, several structures must have been here, including at least one barn, smokehouse, kitchen, and a privy with walkways connecting them to the house. To find what remains of those early structures and anything else, Wagner must first establish over the entire yard an imaginary grid of one meter squares. The grid will help keep track and control of the work on the site and maintain relationships between the artifacts and whatever else is found. The Crenshaws moved away in the late 1850s and since then other families occupied the house and used the yard. Whatever artifacts and features are found will include those later years. With the grid established, technology will now pinpoint where to dig. This device uses a variety of geophysical imaging technologies to locate places where the topsoil has been disturbed. It measures magnetism and electrical resistance and includes radar that can penetrate the topsoil to locate objects below the surface. Just to the east of that, three anomalies that are evenly spaced. Jared Burks of Ohio Valley Archaeology located 59 anomalies through the geophysical survey as identified in this map. Some of those anomalies may include walkways, stone piers, and other clutter. Of particular interest is the northeast area of the yard. Okay, so this circular thing is the well, and then this more rectangular, larger feature may be a cellar underneath, possibly a summer kitchen, or could just be a root cellar that's out in the yard. Even though the geophysical survey identifies where to dig, there's no way to know what's there until the topsoil is removed. The 
a large number of anomalies exist on this slope, indicating trash was dumped here or that a building once stood here. We have mortar here. All of the excavations of the Crenshaw Yard will now be done by hand, a single shovel full at a time. Each must be screened for artifacts, a process that can yield interesting results or generate more questions. That's a sort of serving table where, where that you might expect to see with the Crenshaw family. You know, most people aren't drinking out of big goblets. And so part of one of those came out of here. So a couple things that might go with them coming out of here. Of all the stories about the third floor attic rooms, none mention the names and inscriptions that cover the walls. Practically every available surface is marked with handwritten and carved names and inscriptions dating back to the 1840s. They continue into the 20th century and represent some of the tourists who visited the house starting in the 1920s. Of particular interest are a series of drawings and poems written by teenage girls around the turn of the 20th century. These teenage girls are writing poems on the walls and they're drawing pictures of log cabins, drawing their hands, drawing flowers, and they're writing their age. And the most interesting thing is they're writing their weight down. The thing that we wondered about was how do these girls know their weight? That's during the time that a coal mine is operating at the bottom of the hill. These girls are going down and they're getting weighed on the scale at the coal mine. They're coming back up to the house. And, and for the first time in their life, maybe, they know how much they weigh. So this is a big deal. But of all the names, all the dates, all the inscriptions, you don't see anything up there that says, I'm, ter I'm terrified of the attic. The attic is a scary place. Instead, you get these girls writing these nice teenage girl type poems to their friends up there. Nothing about that the attic is scary, nothing about the attic is frightening. They're also not afraid to go up into the attic. And so what it tells you is that a lot of these stories about the attic and being used to confine people and all that developed later. <laughs> the northeast area of the yard seems to be yielding one of its secrets. Ground penetrating radar showed that there was some sort of a feature that uh, the operator thought was a stone-lined uh, vault, possibly a privy vault under the ground. So we came back out here, we probed along the edges of it, and you can hear it when you go down, that the wall is there under the ground. The privy will not be excavated until the spring. In the meantime, several core samples will be taken to determine what may be buried inside. Doug Cossack is seven feet, one inch tall and uses every bit of his size to secure a deep core sample. The samples contain mostly rock and brick fragments, making it difficult to evaluate if anything relating to the Crenshaw era is buried inside. If the feature fails to yield anything but clay and rock to the bottom, Wagner may conclude it belongs to a later era and excavate only enough to identify how it was constructed. The view from Hickory Hill can only be described as stunning. One can imagine John Hart Crenshaw standing on the balcony with a spyglass, keeping an eye on his property. Crenshaw was a refugee of the New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 and 12. He moved to southeastern Illinois, where it is believed as a young man, he went to work in the government salines. How Crenshaw is connected with kidnapping and the use of the attic to hold his victims cannot be verified. One case of kidnapping is known for certain, a case in which Crenshaw was acquitted. According to researcher Ron Nelson, other records exist that point to Crenshaw's involvement with other kidnappings. When John Crenshaw needed money, there were people turned up missing, and you can find a deed record of as he is uh, buying more land. Corollary to that is a deed record in the Gallup County Courthouse where he is buying and filing uh, these deeds but you look back and all of a sudden there's an outcropping of kidnapping. African-American people were kept in a form of slavery within Illinois through indentures. And it was legal to sell people back and forth, to sell these indentures back and forth within the state. It was illegal to sell them out of state. And I think several of those cases he's involved with most likely involve selling indentured people out of state, which then technically turns that into kidnapping. And I think that's what the court cases being brought against him are. 
The remote sensing located a walkway or driveway on the northeast side. Wagner wants to excavate a unit on top of where the features are supposed to be. By the next day, a clearly defined bed of cinders was found that included 19th century artifacts. The feature represents an exciting development because the walkway leads to the same spot of the yard where the remains of a privy and other buildings may exist. The names and inscriptions on the walls and ceiling of the third floor attic will be included in the overall study of the Crenshaw House. Wagner has asked photographer Chuck Swendlin to visit and take a look. Swendlin is known for capturing large, detailed photographic studies of names written on the walls of Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. I'm amazed at this, absolutely amazed. You know, I, I just often wonder what other treasures like this exist all over the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had hints of... The handwriting seems to reflect the mood of those who left them behind. Names and dates without mentioning the 12 rooms and what may have taken place in this third floor attic. Spring arrives and Wagner's crew has located multiple features of the Northwest Yard, including the Crenshaw Privy. The thing is with a privy like this, that takes a, a lot of labor to construct this thing, is that this thing is probably being periodically cleaned out. Uh, it's not the sort of thing, it's the only one like it that we found in the yard. So it's not like when this gets filled up, they go dig another one. What they're probably doing is having uh, either servants clean it out or people that work for them are periodically cleaning it out. So it may be the situation that when you excavate it, you'll find very little in it that goes outside of the vault itself that can go with the family, but you never know. The remote sensing found a number of features in this part of the yard Excavations located several mid-19th century artifacts that include an English maker's mark that dates to Crenshaw. And this mark, which is uh, the mark of an English potter on the back of a plate, uh, it's Alfred Meakin. And uh, it could be uh, mid-1800s, 1860s, although Alfred Meakin, this company, is in business for a long time. And the mark could date later. When we're just Directly behind the house, Wagner found a pair of stone piers. These date from the Crenshaw era because they're made of the same stone as the foundation. Some had suggested that Crenshaw had a carriageway opening where the sliding doors exist today. Because if this porch is here, you're not driving into this, into the house. And in fact, you're coming up to the porch, stepping onto the porch and then going into the house. And, and we're just gonna have to do some more work in this area and try to figure that out and we're also going to go inside the house and look at the foundation from the inside to see what we can see. Off in the distance, the Saline River has flooded an adjacent farm field. Within a month, floodwaters cover the driveway and bring the excavation to a halt. The Ohio River flood of 2011 will reach the second highest river levels in history, second only to 1937. By early spring, the first bag of artifacts arrive in the laboratory. Here they're cleaned and organized before being stored in plastic archival bags. Analysis of the Crenshaw House artifacts will be an ongoing part of the project. By the end of the investigation, tens of thousands of items will be found, most of them broken bits of glass and brick. The Saline River has returned to its channel, opening the site for the summer excavation. The excavation crew includes 10 students, most are anthropology students from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. They will spend the next 10 weeks excavating the site. The Privy Vault has been excavated to a depth of six feet. It represents wealth and status because it's made of cut stone slabs stacked into smooth walls. It is the first stone privy Wagner has seen on a residential site in Southern Illinois. It is significant because it suggests Crenshaw had the labor available to build and maintain it. Most 19th century privies were made of dirt and never cleaned. Crenshaw's privy is clean except for a few artifacts that include animal bones, old nails, and coffee beans. Then a blown glass medicine bottle is found 
and the way the bottle was made indicates it dates from the Crenshaw era. I was blowing it like that, it's blown glass. And then he's got to snap it off like from the rod, and that's okay. the scar from being snapped off at the bottom. There's one more layer of soil to excavate in the privy. At the bottom, they find the remains of a butchered lamb. Wagner says it's likely the household servants prepared the meal to eat for themselves. Two additional features are under investigation in the yard. Both appeared as large anomalies in the geophysical survey last fall. The artifacts include typical items from a 19th century farm, ceramic, wood, and glass, even a piece of iron that was either a hinge or part of a horse-drawn wagon. What was believed to be only a post hole has now expanded to include this large pit filled with stone. A scale map or drawing along with photographs will preserve the original appearance of what was found. That's critical because the process of removing the soil and artifacts actually destroys the feature. It looks like we have a number of features associated with the Crenshaw family that are pretty undisturbed. Uh, a, we've got the privy in this area, uh, we've got their well, uh, we've got what looks like a large cellar, uh, we've also got what looks like a large pit for a post, maybe for, that uh, would have held a dinner bell. For years, tourists visiting Crenshaw House heard the story of Uncle Bob. They heard he served as a stud slave in a third floor attic room. The real story of Uncle Bob ends in Elgin, Illinois, at the State Hospital in the 1940s. And we also were able to look at his medical records, and we had to get a court order to open those records for the purpose of historical research. The significant thing about what we found in all this stuff is that he never mentions the Crenshaw House. He never mentions living in Southern Illinois. He mentions living in Mississippi. He mentions living in Virginia. He mentions living in Tennessee. And he mentions living in Missouri. All the stories that tie him to the Crenshaw House are made by other people. And even when there are newspaper accounts, they're made by other people. They're not quoting him directly. Quoting directly, he never mentions Southern Illinois and he never mentions the Crenshaw family. Could he have been here? He could have. But there's no historical record that places him here. The heat index has reached 113 degrees. Come on, man. The excavation of the Northeast Yard expands, but the hot and dry conditions make for tough going. Tiny ceramic fragments confirm the unit dates from the Crenshaw era. As the investigation of the Northeast Yard concludes, Wagner brings in heavy equipment to strip off large areas of topsoil to make sure nothing is missed. The use of equipment saves time. Plenty of other areas need to be excavated and time is running out for the student crew from Southern Illinois University Carbondale. In less than two weeks, most will return to the classroom. A second unit excavation in the front yard has yielded a surprise. Until now, this part of the site has given up nothing but 20th century artifacts like a 1960s penny or maybe a piece of plastic and a 22 caliber shell casing. The pit that once existed at this location somehow collected two interesting artifacts. They include a piece of metal believed to be a broken piece of jewelry, along with a mid 19th century button. 
On the slope in the west yard, a 19th century walkway is located in the same area where a previous owner said his family used the yard for a variety of daily activities. In the cellar, archaeology doctoral student Ryan Campbell prepares to enter the Crenshaw House crawl space. The only consolation is that the basement is relatively cool compared to the yard, but nevertheless it is disagreeable work. Dust several inches deep with a consistency of talcum powder covers the space. Ryan must crawl with his stomach to collect material for sifting. Pretty thin, so. Every bucket full must be delivered to the crawl space opening. The work manages to debunk one legend of the Crenshaw house. I'm a little dirty. <laughs> Here comes Doug. I don't care. Some believe Crenshaw opened the back of the house to allow for horses and horse-drawn carriages to enter and cloak their arrival. The story goes that Crenshaw used the carriageway to hide the delivery of his kidnapped victims. Hey, Mark, here's most of a plate, or oh, most of a plate, half a plate, quarter of a plate. Got a decoration on it. Oh, a nice maker's mark. As dramatic as the story sounds, the physical evidence in the crawl space tells a different story. These are Crenshaw-era artifacts, a hand-painted teacup, a fragment of what was once an elaborate dish. We did get some big plate fragments, like date from, one dated from 1838 and one dated from 1900. And if you're, used, if you're dragging carriages in there and things like that, those are the sort of things that get shattered and broken up by horses. There are also bottles in there, bottle parts from the early 1800s. So again, you know, finding that sort of thing gives you some indication that that story might not be true. Oh, that's nice. This is what we were kind of, this is what we were hoping to find. It is probably a big platter, so we'd like to get a, more stuff like this coming out of there. Toward the end of July, the excavation units are being filled in as Wagner makes another attempt to find potential artifacts from the summer kitchen. We do know that there are garden furrows in this area and a pit feature. Part of the question, part of what we're going to see in these units is if the garden furrows continue, so we would have a bigger, better idea of where the garden is. You would expect them to have a summer kitchen. And the fact that it's not in a record is, is uh, just something we need to confirm. 19th century families prepared meals in separate buildings to keep heat and fire away from the main house. Because such buildings were common to large households like Crenshaw's, Wagner's convinced it is located somewhere in the yard. The final steps of the Crenshaw investigation get underway at the lab for Southern Illinois University Carbondale Center for Archaeological Investigation. On this day, hundreds of items gathered during the shovel tests are being categorized according to material, glass, ceramic, wood, or metal, and by function, kitchen, agriculture, or clothing. 340 shovel tests collected thousands of artifacts. The ability to study each artifact after they've been cleaned offers a new perspective of the yard not possible at the time. More early 1800 ceramics coming out of these shovel tests than I was aware of when we were doing it. I, I really didn't recognize that material. And, uh, but now that we're uh, a little more, uh, have a little more knowledge about the material that's coming out of the yard and the artifact types, we can, we're starting to see that stuff show up here. So anyway, it looks like there's a more widespread distribution of trash associated with the Crenshaw family than I thought there was when we were out in the field. The soil samples removed from the site are washed to find artifacts not visible at the time of the excavation. This is known as flotation analysis. The process was invented in Illinois in the 1960s to find small items like seeds. This Crenshaw House soil sample comes from the bottom of the privy. It yields small pieces of ceramic and brick along with tiny pieces of bone. Some of the ceramic will undergo a reassembly if enough pieces can be found. Many share the same color and design, but do not come from the same dish. The work resembles a giant jigsaw puzzle that can never be solved, but some pieces do reassemble into their original shape for the first time in a century or more. 
The ceramic fragments from the Crenshaw era represent hand-me-down dishes, according to Wagner. As the household bought new tableware, old dishes were given to the servants to use in their living quarters somewhere in the yard. The investigation identified multiple episodes of people living at the site after the Crenshaws moved away, sometime before the 20th century. These occupants no doubt altered the yard. They probably removed Crenshaw's buildings to put up their own. Various pits, cellars, privies dug for their use collected a variety of artifacts after they were no longer needed. There's little doubt other buildings stood in the yard. Artifacts collected late in the fall after the summer excavations had concluded found a Crenshaw-era cellar on the edge of the museum shed. Wagner is convinced additional evidence of that building exists under the shed and that African-American servants lived there. In the crawl space beneath the house, no evidence was found that horses or carriages entered the back of the house. No evidence of compacted soil or tracks existed beneath the deep layer of dust. Broken but mostly intact artifacts confirmed the finding. Had horses and carriages been allowed to move in that space, those artifacts would have been crushed into unrecognizable pieces. The hallway and the 12 rooms have a dark and severe appearance identical to what one would expect a prison to look like. But the look of the space relates more to time and the addition of objects like iron bars to give tourists what they expected to see. The architectural study found the rooms were constructed with the same material as the rest of the house. The trim, flooring, and other details reflect a desire to make the third floor attic space as nice as the rest of the house. In fact, a three-dimensional rendering of the house makes it possible to see how it was intended to look when it was originally built. Fresh plaster gave the space a bright and airy feel, more like a hotel or a cabin on a steamboat. It may give us that kind of different perception of the house itself by um, reconstructing the house just like this. The hotel theory fits with Crenshaw's failed attempt to build a railroad in Gallatin County just below the hill where the house now stands. Had the railroad been constructed, perhaps Crenshaw, the businessman, envisioned the third floor as a place where travelers could spend the night. The Crenshaw House is indeed an important survivor of a long forgotten chapter of history that relates to the pre-Civil War and African-American experience in Illinois. Had there not been an economic reason to maintain the property, it probably would have fallen in or burned a long time ago. Perhaps that is the one positive aspect of the house and its history as a tourist attraction. The archeological survey now makes it possible to find a new use for the property. Perhaps it could open one day as an interpretive center, a place that could help visitors discover early Illinois in a way they've never known before.